Today we're at Caloosahatchee Regional Park on the shores of the Caloosahatchee River. It's very appropriate because the chapter that we're reading today is about a black striped mullet. Before we start this chapter, I want to talk to you about how red mangroves grow. Now, imagine my hand is the ground and this hand is the oak tree. An oak tree's roots go right down into the ground and then the trunk stands up nice and straight. But with a red mangrove, the roots go down into the ground, but they also stand up on top of the water and make like a little cage, which helps protect the fish. Angel, you could be, make your finger a little fish and swim right in there. So that way, the, little, the big fish can't uh, attack the little fish. Baby mullet swims from the Gulf of Mexico through Stump Pass. In Lemon Bay, he keeps to the shallows where the mangroves grow. Their prop roots crisscross in the water. Big fish cannot move through the tangle of roots, so the little fish are safe. The mullet eats tiny animals and plants. Where the water is still, he finds mosquito larvae to eat. He grows bigger. One day, he is feeding in the seagrass near Cedar Point. A teacher from Cedar Point Environmental Center leads a wading trip. A girl scoops the mullet in a dip net and dumps him into a bucket. The girl says, Look, a little fish. The mullet sees only the white plastic sides of the bucket. The teacher looks at the fish. That's a finger mullet, also called a fingerling. I grew up eating mullet. The girl's mother says. The girl grabs her mother's arm. Don't eat this one. Don't worry. It's it's too small to eat, the mother says. Let's give it a name, the girl says. It already has a name, the teacher says. Muggle, Mugle Cephalicis. That's a funny name and hard to say, too. The girl bends over the bucket and whispers to the fish. It's the scientific name for the fish. It means bullet head or helmet head. The teacher explains. The mother looks closely at the fish. Its head is shaped like a bullet, like a bullet. The teacher says to the girl and her mother, Look for a few minutes and then let it go. The mother and the girl watch the fish. It doesn't seem to move at all. The girl says, Okay, mama, I'm ready to let it go. The mother pours out the bucket and Muggy darts away. Bye-bye, Muggy, the girl says. Hi, I'm Carol Mahler, author of Adventures in the Charlotte Harbor Watershed, a story of four animals and their neighborhood. And today I'm in the studio with the adventurers and Angie McStravick. Thank you, Carol. I'm with the Environmental Education Program of Lee County Schools, and I'm glad to be here today. Thanks. Um, today we're going to read a sidebar written by Lisa Figueroa. She teaches at Le Taylor Ranch School in Sarasota County, and she wrote about mullet. The adult striped mullet is bluish gray or greenish on top, becoming silver with long stripes on the sides and white on the belly. Adult mullets spawn offshore in the winter, producing one to seven million eggs. Many eggs are eaten before they hatch. Many hatchlings are also eaten. When young mullet reach the size of about one inch, they swim inshore to very shallow water where they find hiding places and food. After reaching two inches in length, these young mullet move into deeper water. Most mullet live seven to eight years, but the oldest one on record is 13 years. Thank you for reading that, Angie. My pleasure, Carol. Now, have you ever seen a mullet, not just seen from a distance, but been up close and personal with one? Well, I don't know about personal, but <laughs> I see them often when I'm taking students on field trips out to Ding Darling or out to, uh, to Pine Island or Mat Lache. They're very common in those waterways, so we do see them quite often. Now, you have ever had a student catch one in a dip net? No, I have not had that experience, but I think the mullet are a little too fast and a little too uh, smart for that. <laughs> Now, mullet was uh, very big and very popular in southwest Florida, especially historically as a food source. Mm -hmm. And it still is, especially if you head out to Mat Lache or Pine Island. It's still s widely sold out there in the bait shops and the fish shops, and people still eat it today. They smoke it. They make it, uh, dips out of it. It's very common out there. Thank you very much for joining me today, Angie. 
And thank you also for joining us here in the television studios of the School District of Lee County. Most visitors drive on Minnesota Key Road to Stump Pass Beach State Park to enjoy the Gulf Beach. But Muggy swims with many other small mullet between the two islands east of Minnesota Key that are also part of the park. The group of mullet is called a school, and it protects the mullet from predators because there is safety in numbers. Muggy hears a loud noise. Then he sees a boat pass over the seagrass. The motor has a propeller that looks like the blade of a fan. It moves water instead of air. In places, the propeller cuts the seagrass. Sometimes grass tangles around the prop and is pulled up by its roots. This kills the grass and leaves a scar or sandy place in the meadow of seagrass. Standing in the shallows, a little blue heron watches the school of mullet. When one mullet strays over the bare sand, the heron eats it. Muggy and the school scoot into the seagrass to hide. The boat's motor stops and Muggy hears voices coming from the boat. We can't get to Sarasota Bay from here. A woman says. Sure we can, but not today. A man says. How? The woman asks. The man points. See those red and green signs in the water? They mark the intracoastal waterway, a deep channel made for boats. We can follow it north to Sarasota. How long will it take? The woman asks. The man says. I'd say about an hour. First we'll go under the bridge to Englandwood Beach, and then, then through Lemon Bay in all along Minnesota Key. That sounds like fun, she says. The man baits the hook on his fishing pole. It's really fun going through Venice because the waterway is a narrow canal. On the north side of Venice, the channel goes into Roberts Bay and into Dona Bay and on up to Sarasota. That means the city of Venice is an island, she says. That's right, thanks to the intercoastal, coastal, but most people don't think of it that way because the waterway is so narrow and three bridges connect to the mainland. Most islands have wider stretches of water around them. I can't wait to see it, she says. Today, I just want to fish, he says. When he casts his line, the boat rocks. A shrimp on a hook plops into the water. The school of fish zips away. I'm Rick Tully. I'm with the Environmental Education Program in Lee County Schools. And I'll be reading uh, some text written by Barbara Davis from Port Charlotte Middle School in Charlotte County. She wrote about seagrasses. Seagrasses are flowering plants that grow underwater. Like all plants, they need light, so they grow best in clear water. Most grow in the shallows. But if light can reach them, they can thrive in deeper water. There are four common seagrasses, widgeon grass, manatee grass, shoal grass, and turtle grass. A rare seagrass is star grass. They all make oxygen and are food and shelter for many animals. Seagrasses also help keep the water clean by trapping soil particles with their leaves. Dredging kills seagrasses, but even a boat's propellers can cause damage. So in seagrass beds, the boat's motors should be raised or shut off. In Little Gasparilla Sound, Muggy and the School of Mullet feed. Today, they are in the prop routes near a fishing area of Don Pedro Island State Park. Muggy and the other mullet hear some splashing in the water. They see the feet and legs of a man and a boy as they wade into the water. Not far from them is a school of big mullet. Some of the fish jump from the water. When they fall back into the water, they make a slapping sound. The two people stand still for a few minutes. Then the man twists as he throws a cast net. The net spreads over the water and makes an eight-foot circle. As it hits the water, the lead weights around the edges splash. Some mullet are trapped inside. Others get away before the net sinks to the bottom. The man yanks the draw line of the net. 
Then he pulls the mullet through the mesh of the net and breaks the neck of each fish. He tells the boy, This is called choking the mullet. It kills them so they can't escape. It also bleeds them so the filet will be white when we clean them. Muggy watches. How come you don't catch mullet with a hook? The boy asks. The man works the net. You can, but it takes a long time to catch as many as you can with a net. Besides, sometimes a mullet won't bite on a hook. Why not? The boy asks. The man says, Mullet are different than most fish. They use some of the sand grains that they eat to help them grind their food. It works inside a special part of their body called a gizzard. Chickens and other birds have gizzards too. The boy says, Maybe that's why mullet jump. They think they can fly. The man laughs. That reminds me of a story I once heard. Back in the 1920s, three fishermen were arrested for fishing for mullet out of season. In a courtroom, a biologist said that only birds have gizzards, and he said that mullet have gizzards. Then, the, then a lawyer said that if what the biologist said was true, then mullet are birds. The judge didn't believe the lawyer, but he found the fisherman not guilty. Muggy and the school swim away. For free classroom materials, please visit our website at www.chnep.org.